It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Naftali Tishbi, who's going to talk about uh, the information bottleneck view of deep learning uh, coming from the Hebrew University. All right. Uh, good morning. It's uh, really an honor to be here. I, I uh, so far uh, the levels of the talk were so high that uh, after no chance I can uh, meet this. But so I want to tell you. I mean, deep learning is sufficiently um, difficult and interesting uh, to 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 require several different ways of thinking about it. And uh, so I I have my own. Uh, uh, quite different from most, most of what we hear so far, way of thinking about deep learning. It's by no means uh, an attempt to really give you a complete uh, understanding of anything. It's just another perspective which comes from uh, uh, analogies of information theory, which I must say, surprisingly to me, uh, received a lot of attention since we introduced it in a very rough and very crude uh, paper. Uh, and. Uh, so I have, I mean, a lot of uh, citations already, but also a lot of criticism, which uh, is largely, uh, partly stupid and, and partly justified and, 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 uh, and actually very interesting. So I decided to, to um, take this opportunity to this uh, respectable audience to, to actually talk about the criticism a little bit. <laughs> and uh, so essentially the, the first part of my, uh, I'm going to review the theory for those who we don't know, it actually reviews some of the aspects of the theory which I never get to talk about, which are really the most interesting one. So essentially, the, the idea of uh, applying information theory to deep learning is really not new. I, I thought about something like this already in the 90s, where statistical physics of, uh, deep of, of, of uh, neural networks emerged, and, and some uh, basic ideas about what we now call large-scale learning, uh, at least in the work we did with uh, Chaim and Sebastian here and others, uh, emerge in the sense that we don't really want to capture the, the worst case behavior, but only the typical behavior in some, in the same sense that statistical physics is, is giving us the typical behavior of physical system, but there are always, uh, you know, pathologies, uh, border cases where, where, where those uh, uh, elements of the physical mechanics, which are also elements of information theory, are just asymptotic elements, uh, typical behavior elements don't capture uh, the worst case behavior. So in, in, in some sense, I, I, since the late 80s already, think that uh, learning in general is a phenomena, is a large scale phenomena in some sense, uh, that, uh, and we should focus on the typical concentrated bulk of, of, the, of, the, of the patterns that we, we can recognize, and, 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 and we have, there's always going to be outliers uh, in, in the boundaries which we cannot really capture. So that's a fundamental uh, uh, difference between the, the kind of learning theory that we're used to in uh, computer science, at least uh, till now mostly, which is a focus on, on worst case analysis of, uh, of uh, behavior of algorithms. And we see all sorts of you know, the examples that we got on the, on the first talk uh, and this, in this meeting. I mean, the boundaries between difficult and hard are actually extremely difficult to characterize and to and to explain in, in, in general in computer science. But uh, in many cases, we characterize the, the, the bulk, the, the interesting, the, the typical behavior. So the first thing we actually did, I mean, this idea of uh, trying to think about uh, learning using information theoretic concepts is something very, very old for me. I mean, it, it really emerged in the early 90s. And, and what we did is essentially introduce some sort of visualization in two dimensions of the dynamics of deep learning in what I call the information plan. I'll, I'll explain it more in detail. And, and this, as I said, uh, created a lot of uh, tension because it seems to give you some sort of an x-ray of what's going on in the network in a way which no, no other method could. And, and that's why we called it uh, opening the black box in some sense. But at the same time, uh, I mean, we, this uh, deviation from the worst case uh, bounds to some sort of typical data dependent input compression bounds created a lot of uh, anger in some sense in, in, in computer science and, and many people decided that uh, this is wrong or this is not useful. And so, I, I, so I'm going to go through essentially the, the interesting part of the story is this combination that uh, we see this typical behavior and we have uh, some sort of an explanation how stochastic gradient descent can actually 
explain this type of pictures that we see in the, in the high dimensional. Uh, so this connection between uh, the dynamics of training and uh, visualization in only two dimensions of the whole process, layer by layer, was some sort of striking. I mean, to me, this was a, a striking uh, picture, at least, that called for some deeper explanation. So I had, uh, mostly on my own, uh, all sorts of mathematical, very crude mathematical attempts to explain it. And of course, uh, like, you know, the physics of uh, theoretical physicists, it has a lot of uh, holes and, and, and uh, discrepancies which have to be filled. And that's why I think this audience is, uh, is the ideal audience to try to, to close these gaps. But I, I, in no way I, I'm saying that I have a complete story. But the interesting part is really that this uh, connection between the stochastic dynamics and the compression of the representation also gives some interesting prediction about the benefit of the deep multiple layers. I mean, why more layers are better than fewer layers in an entirely different perspective than the one we, those that we had so far. It's not expressivity, it's really the, the nature of the dynamics of the encoder layer by layer. And then uh, the most interesting aspect of this theory is that this picture in the information plane, the two-dimensional description of the, of, the, of the neural networks, is giving us some very concrete and, and, and uh, uh, predictions, uh, I don't know, uh, intriguing predict predictions on the actual structure of what the layers encode, because the pair of encoder and decoder pairs are highly constrained in these two dimensions and are completely prediction predicted by information theory. Again, in this asymptotic regime that we can talk about typical behavior. So this is a, these uh, bullets, uh, blue bullets, are essentially the, the, my uh, highlights of the achievements of this picture. Um, so it's some sort of a coherent, multiply connected, one idea that explains a lot of things, or at least has the potential to explain. And at the same time, uh, there are, there are from, from the very beginning, even before we, before we managed to get the paper, the first paper out, there were already papers attacking us, and. Um, uh, so first of all, why, why information measures are relevant or are they relevant for learning at all? Uh, 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 is the representation compression important for generalization? I mean, so that's something which I heard for a lot of, from a lot of theoreticians, uh, Nati Srebro, uh, my friends in Jerusalem, and so on, uh, and many others that uh, show us in, in various ways that representation compression, unlike sample compression, is not, is not enough for generalization, and I want to discuss this. And actually, there's just recently, last, last month, appeared another very interesting paper from three people in Tehran, uh, whom I don't know, <laughs> yeah, but uh, really, uh, in, a very, in a very interesting way, attack, attack the whole view of using information theory to learning, and I'll address this. Then there, are, of course, there are, there are attacks or there are, there are problems with the, the claim that uh, stochastic gradient descent is actually responsible for this uh, compression. And, and of course, there are many results that show that the stochasticity in, uh, in learning is in the gradient descent is not really essential. So what's going on here? I mean, I'm, I'm one of the very few who claim that maybe the noise actually helps. I saw some posters in this meeting that support this view as well. Um, and of course, uh, the last two bullets are usually not a text because most people don't really get to this part of the theory. I mean, do the IB encoder decoder pairs really characterize the layers? And, and uh, there is a, there are a list of pa some papers that rediscover the fact that the information bottleneck is, is ill-defined in some sense in the deterministic case where the rules are not stochastic. And, and, and uh, I'm going to address this at the end. We actually have a very nice way of uh, thinking about this deterministic rule, the deterministic limit of the information bottleneck. And if I, I'll get to it, if I have time, I actually want also to, to give you some new things, uh, which are really, to me, the, the highlight or the most interesting aspect of the story, which is really the, if the, this two-dimensional description of the, of the dynamics of learning is, is really capturing something essential and interesting, the, there is a, a critical uh, point analysis of the problem, which is data-dependent. As we just heard, it depends on the statistics of the labels and data in a very interesting way, but they actually give a very rich structure to the, to the, whole, the whole plan, which I believe is really the, in, the, in the heart of the, the, the this is really the, the skeleton of, of the dynamics of learning. But I want to tell you something about it, including uh, ending by this uh, story about the deterministic limit. 
By the way, I forgot to mention, of course, that the whole story is done with several good students, in particular, Gnoga Zaslavsky and Ravid Shvaziv, and, and then a few others, uh, Amichai Pensky, Zoe Piran, and Tom Benger, who is responsible for this geometric picture to a large extent, and Shlomi Agmon. Okay, so uh, the story that many of you heard, I'm going to go through it very, very quickly, unless you have uh, you stop me with questions, is that if you can think about uh, the layers of deep neural network as a Markov chain of representations. That's the first clear observation. Once the weights are fixed, uh, each layer can be calculated from the previous layer. And, as, and if I think about the input as x and then label as y, I get some statistics of uh, inputs and, 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 and labels. This is what I call data. And it's completely independent of the, of the model. And then the, there is a cascade of changes of representations uh, through the hidden layers, which eventually and generate uh, all together form some sort of an internal representation of the data, but his hierarchy is really very interesting. And I'm specifically interested in the dynamics of why and what each layer uh, encodes, which is not just encoded, but the bulk of the whole weight. So I, again, I believe that there is an interesting story of the evolution of those representations through the layers. Now, uh, since it's a Markov chain, and I can write it, this graphical model as arrows between the chain, the, the, the immediate, uh, of course, the last hidden layer is the, well, sometimes called the feature layer, or the, is the one from which I make a prediction of the, of the labels, and which I call y hat here. It's not true label, it's the, the output of the network, and of course, if the network is well trained, uh, y hat and y are, are similar enough, but in general, this is a different, a different uh, process. I mean, in, in the learning, I have y, x, and I generate x hat. This is what I call training. And in the prediction, I get x, and I generate y hat in this Markov chain, x, x hat, y hat. So these two things are different. Actually, re recently, with, uh, with Zoe Piran, we managed to characterize the difference between these two problems. I mean, the learning is what I call the direct bottleneck problem. I want to squeeze or somehow compress x into this internal representation such that y is well predicted. But in the, in the prediction problem, I, I take x and I average over the internal representation in some sense to get the best y hat. And this is what I call the dual information button problem. And we just had a recent, uh, recently an I, I clear paper, still anonymous, uh, on this idea. Now, uh, essentially, the, uh, I, I, I am going to skip this. You all know what mutual information and what KL divergences are. And of course, what we should know is that one of the interesting, uh, actually, I believe very important properties of mutual information is what we call DPI, or data processing inequality, that information can only decrease when you move along a, mar a Markov chain. And since it can only decrease, of course, first of all, it's completely invariant to one-to-one -one transformations, which is a big problem computationally, because I can encrypt my data in some very complicated way, and information will not see it at all, in principle. But of course, when you measure information, you have to discretize, you have to coarse grain the system, and that's, that's where it's going to completely fail. But uh, this data processing inequality is really imposing some sort of interesting uh, chains of inequalities on the information between the input and each one of the layers and the information of the true label, the desired label, and each one of the layers. And this uh, Markov chain uh, inequalities uh, are, are, are uh, a thing I wanted to see. And the, the first idea was really, how does it look? I mean, that, let's take a deep neural network, train it, and measure these quantities and see how they behave. And of course, the idea was that somehow information is lost between the layers, and only the relevant information or the relevant feature or the best representation preserves through this process, this cascade of sometimes what we call a, a successfully refinable representations, which eventually the last one should, should give you a a efficient representation of only the relevant parts of the pattern. That's the idea. But the question, of course, whether we actually see it. I mean, so this type of coarsening of the representation, whether it's really there, and of course, for this, we need to to estimate information, which is a big, a big, a big headache. But I, but I just want to give you this picture that, for me at least, was a, the turning point. I mean, so we actually did it. Of course, in order to actually measure this information, you need some sort of uh, quantization of the layers, of the units in each layer. We look at every layer as a single random variable, so that's a very high dimensional random variable. So of course we cannot do it in large, in large networks. So we took a very small network with only 12 binary inputs where we can actually measure everything, and we 
discretize the units, but not during the training, but as a wrapper. I mean, so we train the network with usual backpropagation, and of course, completely a TensorFlow uh, standard way. And then we, at each epoch of training, we measured something, which is a crude estimate, if you want, of the mutual information by discretizing, by binning the units um, between the layers and the input and the layer and the output. And this we could do because this is a finite simple problem. And we did it 100 times with random initial conditions of the weights, small Gaussian distribution around zero. Just, and what we saw is that in this amazing uh, uh, dynamics of the, of the, of the network, so I'm sure many of you saw this already, but I always have to emphasize that there's some very intriguing features to this simulation. I mean, first of all, I'm sorry, first of all, there is this uh, concentration. I mean, all those different 100 networks which have different weights and different, different values and different layers essentially do the same trajectories in this plane. And, and second, uh, so first of all, why do they concentrate? I mean, is this a general phenomena? Is this something I expect to see better? Actually, of course, we understand it now. And the larger the problem, the, 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 more, uh, uh, the, the sharper the concentration. This is precisely the kind of thing that uh, we hope to see in statistical physics. I mean, so if I increase the input, the concentration becomes sharper and sharper. And I know this already. At least for patterns which are what I, what I call uh, have this typicality argument. So, and the second thing is, is this uh, interesting, intriguing, so not only the, the layers which have different colors they concentrate, but they also seem to move in, in, in a very typical way, which uh, on average looks like this. And so this is again a picture you may have seen. So you, they usually very quickly come up to some point where they gain information about the label. And actually, information about the label is a bound on the generalization error, so, so uh, more information about the label is better generalization. So of course, the network want, want to, go, to go high. This is the full information, not the training information uh, about, about the label. So from A to C, you see that all the layers essentially come up in this plan, reach this, uh, this interesting point here. And then from C to E, there is this relatively slow mo motion of all the layers up to almost, to almost to the top of this information plan. So, Again, I, I, I said it many times, but this is the information about the label, this information about the data, and you see that the last layer here reaches a point which essentially has very little information about the input, and essentially it's almost the same information about the input as, as about the label, which means it's close to what we call in statistics minimal sufficient statistics. It captures precisely the information that we need in order to make the prediction. And the interesting question that arises just from this picture First of all, why all the layers do this type of motion to the left? I mean, not only the last layer, layer by layer, they seem to what I call compress the representation. And we, we see that the main improvement in generalization happens between C and E, where, where the, uh, all the layers essentially uh, move slowly to the, and end at different positions along a very in, important line, which is predicted theoretically. And what, this is what we call the information bottleneck bound, and, and they stop in, at some point and don't move from there. So this raised a lot of interesting mathematical questions. I mean, first of all, why do they go up? We know, okay, because we train to minimize error. But why do they move to the left was not clear. And do they always move to the left? And, what, and does it help you? I mean, this compression of the representation does, the fact that it happens layer by layer in some sense, seem to, to say that all the layers in some sense improve the representation. And, and, and the last question that I want to address mostly today is what characterize these points, L2, L3, and so on, where the layers actually help stop and don't move from them? What's, what's so special about this? The more we can say about the dynamics of this, of this picture, the better. This, is, this was my, my research plan three years ago when we saw this picture for the first time. And this was striking. I mean, a lot of people, when they see this, say, ah, there is something here. Now, the way to think about, about the layer is, and, and this is a, a picture which is very common today, is to think about each, net, is la each layer in the network, each hidden layer, as having two functions, essentially. One is what I call the encoder, the map from the input to the layer, which is, in general, a stochastic map. Uh, and the second one is the decoder, I mean, the, ma the, the map from the layer to the label, or if you want the, the map from the layer to the desired label, 
which is really the base optimal decoder. Now it turns out that the decoder, of course, when you have a hidden, when you have a deep neural network, you start with a very complicated decoder, which essentially is the whole, the whole network. And, and then when you move layer by layer, the, the decoder gets simpler and simpler, and the encoder gets harder and harder, and more and more complicated. And all the complexity of the problem moves to the encoder. And of course, the fact that there are many layers tells you that this shift from encoding to decoding is happening gradually in some sense. So the encoder only, only needs to, to encode the, the previous layer and not everything from it. So this is something which uh, we found striking. And of course, we have some sort of a theorem. It's not, I, I wouldn't call it a perfectly rigorous theorem, but I call it a, a theorem nevertheless. It's a, what I call an information th plan theorem, is that for typical, in the strict sense of information theory, where asymptotic equipartition happens, and when essentially the entropy characterizes the size of the typical objects in my, from my variable, and that's not always the case. I mean, that's one of the interesting attacks on, on our work, that entropy is not always the log of the number of objects in your variable uh, when you go to the limit, uh, because there are distributions which are known to by the name of uh, low entropy, heavy tail distribution, where essentially, where essentially look like a delta function plus uh, something which is smeared all over the place. Uh, so, so this type of distribution have low entropy, but the, the entropy is the not the log of the, the number of objects. There. there are many, many what we call non-typical objects, or most objects are non-typical. And such distributions kill my theory. That's clear. And this is part of the attacks. But if I have this typical input, which means I, I'm willing to settle only for the bulk of the distribution, which in some sense is most of the thing that I care about, then this is true. Essentially, the sample complexity of the decoder is completely determined by the mutual information of the encoder. And the generalization is completely determined by the mutual information of the decoder. OK, so why, why there is concentration? I mean, that's the first thing to understand. And so we don't have a general theory, I mean, but we know that information theory is full of examples like this where you have concentration of so, of course, the easiest example which everybody knows is that when you have IID data, uh, the, pro the joint probability of IID samples is just the product and then the log uh, averages. Okay, very nicely by the sensor limit theorem. What is not known is that in a much more general situation, there is what we call the, the shannon macmillan Bryman theorem. Uh, in a much more general situation, the, the log of the probability of many variables in the limit, one over n, the log, approach the, the entropy. And that's true even in many cases when they are not independent. If there is some sort of a mark of dependency between the, as long as it's stationary in some sense, or in my case, if you take, think, for example, of an image, an image uh, has patches uh, where I can essentially think about it as a collection of many patches which are conditionally independent. For any graphical model with, with low degree connectivity, uh, essentially has this type of property, or any, any physical system with Hamiltonian with only lo local interactions have this property. So this property, the shannon macmillan bryman limit, is actually much more general than, than just IID points. And I argue that if my images, my, my patterns are large enough, such that I can decompose their probabilities uh, in a sense, uh, in, in a sense uh, very similar to this, such as the probability of the pattern condition on the representation uh, both the probability is more or less factorizes locally, like in graphical models, then this thing is going to average very nicely using the central limit theorem in exactly the same way that happens in information theory for IID data. And under these conditions, it's very clear why both mutual information, the information about the input, information about the output are going to concentrate. And that's why I see this nice concentration, although I, my patterns in this experiment are not factorizable in any explicit way. I argue that this is a very general phenomena, at least for the kind of patterns we use in deep learning, like images, speech, and natural language, and so on, where you have only local connectivities and lo local dependencies in your, among your variables, and which is bounded degree or almost bounded degree. And that's, of course, something which I would like to be able to formulate more, more carefully, but at least the intuition is very clear. It's for the same reason that uh, partition functions in statistical physics average uh, and so on. I mean, it's same, exactly the same reasoning. Uh, even in, in random systems. So this is, once we see this, then of course you have this tool 
of, of looking at neural networks, and this is what I call the x-rays of the neural network, by essentially doing this type of analysis of the, what is the trajectory of each one of the layers. And again, this is a picture which uh, many of you have seen probably. So again, the, the effect of decreasing the sample size is the next, or maybe the most important question, what happens to the layers when you train from small data compared to large data? And what we see here, again, for the first time that I think this phenomenon was observed, is that essentially the layers do something, the epochs here is, is, is marked by the color, and, and you see that the, the first phase of the training is, is, uh, is essentially the same even if you have very little data, which means this falling to essentially medium generalization, it's not, it's not zero, it's actually about half of the information uh, about the label, but then the second phase where you try to refine your, your representation, if you have poor data, you get, you get the flange information is not going up as here, but essentially goes down. And this is, of course, the, the clear analogy of overfitting. I mean, you're trying to, to, to get more information from your sample that you're allowed, and we can explain this type of bound. So what is really interesting is that the theory tells us what these lines are both when you have the full data and when you have a, sample, a small sample, and these lines where the layers eventually lie uh, are independent of the architecture, essentially. They, they, they are a function of the sample size and the, and the data itself, which is really interesting. So, of course, the architecture affects the trajectories, but not the, the limiting line. And when you have small data, uh, it's trying to over-compress in some sense, or essentially it's a misalignment of some sort of a covariance matrix, which uh, uh, when you have down data, you can't estimate it, and you get that eventually over-compressing is reducing the information, and that's where early stopping can really help you. So at least it's, it's an interesting way of looking at this well-known phenomena, which tells you something, I believe, new about, about the, the, the whole story. Now, if I just want to address the debates, so, first of all, the first attack uh, made by Sachs et al. Uh, already in 2018, before the papers was, uh, uh, essentially it was just an, an archive paper that was rejected from NIPS <laughs> at that time. I didn't know that, but, so essentially, uh, the, the, main, the main criticism was uh, how do you estimate information? I mean, this binning seems like a very crude way of doing it. So actually we did the binning uh, the binning, uh, okay, okay, even for that, the binning we did was, was, was very done relatively carefully. We didn't write it, but we made sure that binning the layers doesn't really affect the performance. So we know that this binned information is really essential. And below this, actually, we were looking for the, the, the closer pro possible representation of the units, which still preserve the, the performance of the network. So it's not an, an arbitrary binning. But, but uh, the more important thing is that this is just a wrapper. I mean, we didn't touch the dynamics of the training. We did it in exactly the same way as everybody. And we just put this on top of the, the network in order to see what's going on. It's just like doing an x-ray. When you don't have to do an x-ray if you don't want to, but if you actually want to see what's going on, this is not going to affect your disease in most cases. It's just a way of seeing what's going on. It's the same, it's the same uh, network. We just look, have a, a, a way of seeing the dynamics. Now, whether information is relevant or not, or, I mean, there was, there was a, a problem that the information is hard to estimate in high dimension, because you need to, to know something about joint distribution high of, 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 of variables in very high dimension. It's impossible to estimate empirically without some sort of assumptions, approximations, either parametric or non-parametric. If you don't know more, you cannot. But this is true also for you think, things like energy and entropy in physics. I mean, in most cases, I don't know how, how to estimate it. I, I, we got used to it. I mean, we measure temperatures, we assume equilibrium, we do all sorts of things. But there's no direct way of estimating the entropy of, this, of the molecules in this room or the, even the energy. So we are working with concepts like this for many years and I'm quite happy with them. So I don't see why this should be a problem. And uh, so, okay, so this is a wrapper. And, and of course, uh, this is just a visualization tool which doesn't affect the training at all. So this was the first, the first criticism. The binning, as I said, can give you very arbitrary values. If you don't do the binning carefully, you can get uh, whatever you want. With, but if you, if you try to bin it just in the right way, I mean, those, this, this discretization of the units, this quantization is essential for measuring information. Information cannot be measured without the quantization in, in general. There's a very nice limit 
if you, if you want the precision to, to be very, very high and you actually want infinite precision in your input and infinite precision in your weights, you have to take the data to infinity before that and do the, the limits very carefully. You first take the data to infinity, and then you take the quantization to zero if you actually want to get meaningful results. So the quantization is essential. The question is whether we have clever quantization. I think with, that what we did was, was reasonable. It was not probably the best thing to do. We didn't think too much about it. Now, uh, there, there was another interesting point that uh, made by Andrew Zaks in, in, in his paper, is that the observed compression is essentially a result of the saturation uh, of, the, of the units. I mean, we had sigmoidal units, so essentially when you train with outer regularization, eventually you get this uh, saturation, or if you want, vanishing gradients, uh, which, is, which is really what uh, people see everywhere, but this is simply not true. I mean, uh, we, we, have, uh, we see the compression way before the saturation of the units, thousands of epochs of training before, there's no vanishing of the gradients, and we also see the saturation in, in values Although there's a fundamental difference in non-saturated nonlinearities like values and saturated nonlinearities, so so this is a simply wrong uh, wrong statement. But although although I think there's a lot to be said about why values uh, behave differently, and and one of the reason is that this partitioning of the input to cells, which is very clear when you do hard partition like like a, you know a, a sine functions, then then the, the cells are really isolated. When you do soft partitions. Or, or even softer partition like values, there is a lot of influence and a lot of information that connects the different partitions, even if there are no labels explicitly. And that's why values really behave much in a very different way. We're just starting to, to look more carefully into this and whether we can actually uh, quantify this difference between uh, saturated and non-saturated nonlinearities. And I thank Andrew for pointing it out, but this is not the reason for the compression. Okay, so, so the information bottleneck is, again, it's an old idea, which I, I believe is capturing something very fundamental. And this is, I have complex data. What is the minimal information in this data which tells me something about another variable? It's just a direct generalization of the idea of minimal sufficient statistics that Fisher introduced already in 1920 or even before. And, uh, and, and which essentially, okay, just like the mean and variance of a Gaussian variables, I don't need to, the sample mean and sample variance tell me everything I need to know about the parameters. There are some sm simple functions, which we usually call features, or useful features, which really capture everything that I want about the label. So in principle, what I wanted is some sort of a computational scheme to generate minimal sufficient statistics. And, uh, and this was by itself, to me at least, a, a fundamental question. And, and, uh, and the, the, the interesting part is that this is actually, uh, in some sense, tractable. I mean, given the joint distribution of two variables, there is a way of extracting successively. It's the minimal sufficient statistics don't exist in general, only for very special distributions, exponential forms. But, but, but I can approximate them and, and lose as little as possible information by still reducing the number of features. So this, I believe, is a basic statistical question which is related also to rate distortion theory and to many other uh, questions in statistics, and of course also related to statistical physics in some interesting way, because the way we solve it is by solving this variational problem, minimize of all possible encoder the information in the data and the representation, subject to a constraint on the information on the label. And this is what we call then in, in the 90s uh, uh, the information bottleneck problem. And to me, this was something that, like, you know, uh, the, the, the dream of, of philosophers, I mean, uh, uh, if I know how to answer this question, there are many, many different problems that can be addressed using the same principle. And of course, what, what brought my attention that this may be related to deep learning is actually a paper by, uh, by Meta and, and, and Schwab, who is sitting here, uh, that it was trying to connect uh, deep learning with the renormalization group in physics. Essentially by saying that the layers, layer by layer, somehow refine the relevant information. And when I saw, I read this interesting paper, I said, okay, this is the bottleneck exactly. And, and what we need to show is that the layers indeed refine the relevant information, but not using renormalization, which is only very, very intuitively related to deep learning in general, but unless you have fractals or something like this. But uh, uh, in general, you, 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 you don't, uh, there's no self-similarity in the data in any explicit sense, and, uh, but you do have this way of 
compressing the representation without losing information about the label. And what is really nice is that we get the, the solution, the optimal solution of this problem is, is essentially uh, two equations which are alternating self-consistent connection between the, end, the optimal encoder and the optimal decoder. So essentially what we do is iterate these two equations, this alternating projection between the encoder and the decoder. This is known in information theory as the remote blout or the blout or remote algorithm for ray distortion theory. Essentially it's a some sort of generalization of it. And what we can find for every value of beta, which is essentially every value of information that you want to keep, or every value of the distortion, you get a point. And when you when you do it for all possible beta, you get a line, which is this black line here which is the information theoretic limit in this information plane, information about input and output, beyond which there are no representations at all. Okay, so the, the conjecture I had already uh, four years ago or more, uh, six years ago, no, five years ago, uh, essentially was that why I start with neural network that are somewhere in this plane, eventually there's nothing that should stop them from getting to the optimal line. And if they get to the optimal line, which means and then, then, then the encoder-decoder relationship is uniquely determined. There's no other solution. This is the solution. These are the encoder-decoder pairs on the line. Of course, uh, in, in, in real problems, this line can go very high. And in deterministic problems, it actually goes like a straight line up to the label uh, entropy, or one bit if you want, and then another straight line. So the term, in deterministic cases, deterministic functions, the whole information button problem is ill-posed. And we knew it for many, many years. It was rediscovered in some papers recently. But uh, of course, when you have a probability of the label, given the pattern, either one or zero or nothing else, uh, you get that the whole, that the whole system here uh, is, is pathological and you can't really solve it. So the information bottleneck is defined only for what we call strictly stochastic rules, uh, where the py given x, the, the probability of the label given the, the, the pattern, is strictly within the simplex. It's bounded away from the corners of the simplex by some small margin. And then, then beta is uniquely determining the point on this curve, and, and essentially beta is one over the slope of this curve. So these are the, the problems we really care about, what I call smooth and regular problems. Of course, there are other types. If you have zeros in this matrix, or if you have in the, in the co-occurrence matrix, or if you have other problems, then, then, then this can turn into a piecewise linear function in all sorts of ways, and there are essentially gaps in beta for which you don't have a solution, because beta is just the... Okay, so something we also know for a long time, since 2007 or 8, is the work of Ahad Shamir and Sivan Sabato, that in this plan, there's a discrepancy between what you can do from a sample, finite sample, and the full distribution of the data. So if I have the full distribution, I can actually reach this black line, which means I can actually solve it for very small compression. But if I have a finite sample, then I'm on this red line. Essentially, this is the bound that we, we proved in 2008. A, a, a red line means that without compression, there's a huge gap in the information about the label from, that I can get from a sample. And, and the, so I have, to, I have to compress in some sense, because the best information about the label is somewhere around the maximum of this red curve, which is a compressed representation. So this, only this result, which, which, which we, we call the, then the, the sample complexity bound, is essentially telling us that the difference in information, in, in, in essentially this is some sort of a generalization error bound, the, the in empirical information and the true information about the label, which is directly related to the empirical error and the training error, is bounded by something which looks like the square root of two to the compression information divided by number of examples and some, and some logarithmic corrections, which I ignored here. So this is interesting, because it's really telling me, if you don't compress the representation from some finite sample, you are not going to make good generalization. So compression is essential in some sense. It doesn't mean that the layer, each layer has to be compressed. A layer can contain a lot of irrelevant information. For example, a reconstruction information of the input, as they do in ResNets or in RevNets or in I don't know what. There are all sorts of architectures which implicitly or explicitly uh, preserve the information about the input. But what I'm saying that the decoder cannot use this information, otherwise it will, not, it will overfit. So the decoder is actually ignoring the reconstruction information to have in ResNet and RevNets. So this is a statement about the decoder, not the encoder. And, again, and then later on, I actually proved that uh, 
and, and this is again something which was attacked by the, this recent paper from Iran, uh, that uh, uh, if I can say that the cardinality of my hypothesis space of function is exponential, not in the input, but, but essentially is, is the log cardinality is the, is the entropy, then I, I have a, a, nice, uh, a nice type of the generalization, puck-like bound, Again, I don't want to go through it because it, it was in many other talks. But essentially, if the cardinality of all my patterns can be written as 2 to the entropy of x, which means that edge and entropy is the log of the cardinality of the interesting patterns, this is a fundamental property in information theory, which we call the asymptotic equipartition or the, the, the concentration. If it's, which means that essentially most typical patterns have the same probability. And that's really the essential point here, which is 2 to the minus h then the cardinality is simply uh, log of h. Uh, the log cardinality is h, sorry. So then, uh, and if this is also true, not only for the whole patterns, but also for each one of those representations, which are some sort of partition, then I have this very nice connection that compressing the representation gives me a cardinality, which is 2 to the hx divided by 2 to the hx given t, which is precisely the mutual information. And this gives us very interesting uh, bound which looks like a puck bound. There are all sorts of constants which I ignore here, like factor of two here and so on. But essentially, every bit of compression of the representation is equivalent to doubling the data, if this is a, 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 which is really very important. So every bit of motion of the layers to the left is essentially uh, like doubling the training data in terms of effect of generalization. This is true only when you have this concentration of uh, probability in, in the typical case, which is most. So if you think, for example, about images of you know, no megapixel images, what I'm saying is that the compression of all of them concentrates very much on the entropy. So most of the typical images have age x bits of encoding. And if this is true, then this argument is correct. OK. And then we have this essentially. Uh, a type of generalization uh, story. I mean, the generalization error is the difference between the true information about the label and the information I can get from the, uh, from the uh, representation. This is essentially pin screen inequality, and it not, doesn't really matter how I measure generalization and generalization gap. I mean, in many. And the effective dimensionality of the representation is exponential in the mutual information of the compression. Again, this was heavily attacked uh, by other people. Actually, very interesting. The, what, what this uh, uh, Iranian pa pa paper says is that there's a factor of 1 over epsilon in the exponent, uh, which kills the whole thing. Because <laughs> if there's a 1 over epsilon here, a small epsilon will give me an empty bound. This is, very, this is very interesting. I must say that when I first read it, I was really shocked, I mean, in some sense. How can it be? But then, and then I realized, again, if you look at this paper, the, the one that came just uh, last, last month, it's still on the, on the archive. Uh, I realized that what they actually say, I mean, using this idea of low entropy heavy tail distribution, is that they talk about distributions which violate or at least don't obey the typical uh, the asymptotic equipartition property of information theory in some sense, which means that most patterns are non-typical. Okay, if most patterns are non-typical, then what I say is wrong. <laughs> I don't care. And, 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 and of course, of course uh, rigorously talking about the worst case analysis, my bounds are wrong. But if you restrict yourself to typical behavior where you have this concentration of the description length of the pattern, then everything I say at least makes sense. Okay. And of course, uh, they had an other uh, interesting uh, reservation. So essentially, we know that there are algorithms like ResNets, uh, RevNets, I mean, all those things that have the reconstruction term in the in the error, which means that they explicitly try to not to compress, which means they, they keep a lot of information in, in, the, in, the, in the layer, which is used in order to be able to reconstruct the input. So those seem to violate my statement immediately. But what I say, OK, there's a lot of information in the layer, which is simply not used for the prediction. The decoder doesn't use it. If, it. if it uses it, it's not going to generalize. It's going to sit in the wrong part of the plane in terms of generalization. So it's OK. I mean, I can have uh, you know, two types of variables, like you know, Hamiltonian dynamics, momenta and coordinates, uh, which have uh, uh, completely reversible dynamics. All the information is there. But you know, in some dimensions, I can stretch, and some dimensions I compress. And we know that in classical mechanics, uh, even this reversible dynamics can lead to irreversible measurements if I do some sort of course running in general. 
And I think this is precisely what happens in those networks. I mean, there's a mixture of variables. The irrelevant variables are stretched and, and disappear essentially from the averaging, and the relevant dynamics are preserved. Actually, if you look at the papers on, on, on RevNets, for example, they explicitly have this area preserving or measure preserving terms, which looks very much like a Hamiltonian dynamics to physicists at least. Okay, so there are examples in physics at least where reversible dynamics can lead to irreversible measurements if there is some sort of loss of precision. And this is very standard. I mean, this is the reason why uh, entropy grows despite the reversibility of mechanical laws. Now, uh, so this is why I'm not too worried about the fact that there are examples of networks which seem to explicitly not compress. The question is what type of information is actually used in the decoder. So the decoder, as I said, is the easy part, at least at the end. I mean, I have very few, very few cells or very few labels that I really need to remember in order to frame a network. The hard part is the encoder. That's clear to everyone. But remember that in, in, in deep neural networks, the encoder, the coder trade off gradually change. I mean, the encoder becomes more and more difficult, and the decoder becomes simpler and simpler, the more I compress the representation. And the question is whether this transform gradual transformation from layer to layer of the encoder is actually helping. In some sense, I don't overfit, because one of the curses of, uh, of uh, generalization is that if I use my data to select my features, I am bound to overfit. <laughs> This is something, a big no-no in learning theory. Never use your training data to actually select your hypothesis class. Because then, of course, I'm going to select my function in my hypothesis class, and that's it. It's very simple. So, I, but there's something like this that happens, and it's happened gradually when I move from layer to layer in the properties of the decoder. Okay, there's another very correct point made in this paper, if I'm already referring to it. And since this is recorded, I have to be careful. They, they, they may watch it. So eventually, uh, uh, this is uh, the IB bound. If I actually train the, the encoder, those bounds don't tell me anything. I mean, the encoder depends on the data, which means the features depend on the data. Only 10 minutes, wow, okay. Anyway, okay, so this is uh, my answer to this criticism. They are, they are wrong in the sense that they pick a very, a very artificial, non-typical distributions to violate the, the bound, but they are right in the sense that the encoder uh, cannot it's a hard problem. I mean, how to do, how to select the encoder is wrong. Okay. Now, my, my next uh, statement is, is that there is, and I'm going to go through it very, very quickly, is that there is an interesting connection between the gradients of the error and the compression. And this is something which numerically is beyond any doubt. We see it all the time in all networks, small, large, values, saturated, whatever you want, unsaturated. We always see this, that essentially the, 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 the beginning of this compression of the representation happens when the gradients get very small, in this knee of the training error. And, and so the, when the gradients are small, the batches of the, the mini batches of the stochastic gradient descent are actually very noisy, and, and we know this uh, very well. I mean, there's actually a very sharp shift. The, the, the SNR of the gradients go from very high, being very clean gradients, to very low, more or less from 20 dB to minus 20 dB in a very sharp way. And when they, the gradients become noisy, I start to see this compression. So the question is, and this was also attacked by many smart people like Chaim and others, uh, whether, there is a, whether there is any connection between this noise in the gradients and the compression. So I have some crude argument that is using Gaussian channels in order to show that when you get to this point, the gradients start to diffuse I mean, the, the, the weights start to diffuse, the gradients are doing some sort of a random walk in all the irrelevant dimensions, and I argue that this acts like noise to the relevant, essentially reduces the signal-to-noise ratio of the irrelevant properties of the data. And that's why, SN, why SGD is actually compressing the representation. This is, a, this is a very elegant argument, but I'm using very simple information theory, just Gaussian channels, but it may be wrong in the sense that it's not that there's no real noise here. This noise is a random matrix of weights, which is just the integrated noise of the gradients, and it's not really clear why this should act like noise with respect to the true signal that I want to preserve. But it seems very correct in terms of the prediction that it makes. It also seems that the weights grow linearly more or less up to this point where the, the SNR falls down, but then sublinearly more or less like a square root of t, which means that there's indeed some sort of diffusion there. By the way, we, so, so we see the same phenomena in many different problems. This is an entirely different network. Uh, we see the, that there is a, a switch 
in the SNR of the gradients and exactly at the point where the layers start to diffuse to the left. Okay, and this is, we see it in CIFAR, and we see it in MNIST, and we see it in many, so this type of evolution of the layers to the left when the gradients become noisy seemed to me a very established numerical fact, and whether my argument with Gaussian channel is correct or not, this is something for you to decide. Now, as I said, I mean, it happens, that you see the same switch of the flip of the SNR of the gradients, and you see it in all, all, all the problems we looked at, including a lot of real valued problems. This actually gives an explanation, which I'm not going to get into, why adding more layers actually reduces the time of convergence. So I need less iterations, of up, or less updates of the weights and when I have more layers, and this is again something I'm not going to, to get into details, but the, the prediction is that when you increase the number of layers, the number of updates, the number of iterations of backpropagation goes down like a power law uh, up to a point, where this power law, uh, the exponent of this power law is, is predicted from the properties of diffusion in this high dimension. So this again, this is actually related to what Tommy is saying and many, other, many others, and I guess that there are other, other ways of seeing that the number of layers actually improves the convergence time. Not in time, but in terms of number of updates, because an update is much longer when you have more layers. So I don't know, and, and what is exactly the exponent is really, we don't see the same exponents in MNIST as in this, the artificial problems, they have a lot of explanation for that. And of course this doesn't go forever, at some point you, you bounce back, adding more layers doesn't help you forever in terms of, it's a power law up to a point and then you have too many layers and, they, and then it, it starts to, incre to, to increase again the time of convergence. This is essentially the typical behavior. You first go down, and then when you add more layers, you, you go up. This is what happens with MNIST at least. Okay, so I want to take the, the last part of my story, really talk about what I think is the most interesting aspect of this theory, or this framework, I don't know. I don't want to call it theory. I'm, the theoretical physicist theory is something too big for what I'm saying here. So uh, essentially, we know that the topology of the representations must change. I mean, things which are closed in the initial layer may be far, uh, very far in the last layer. I mean, they, they are pushed into different directions, and this happened gradually. So there are topological changes in the representation, and that's very, very important. Without this, I could not do anything. And I know that these topological changes must respond to some sort of splitting or merging of cells uh, of these partitions that are induced by the layers. So I, I have this uh, demo, which I, I don't want to, it will take more, more time than I have right now. But uh, essentially, we, 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 we see it in simulations very nicely, how when you train the network, the layers actually change the representation and eventually split into, this is the fourth layer in this case. It's actually a very nice uh, a Tisney uh, representation of these small dimensional layers. Everybody can, could do this. But the fact is that you can really see that there is a, a change of topology. I mean, things move in different directions. Those changes of topology, and this is really going to be my last point, correspond to the, in the, it happens essentially when the layers are already sliding on the information bottleneck bound, according to my understanding. And on the information bottleneck bound on this black line where the layers are very close to it, the encoder and the decoder are completely determined by the theory and the data, not by the architecture. So the, in, the, the interesting uh, or the, the natural question to ask is, what on this line can change the topology of the representation? So we have an analysis, it's a bifurcation type of analysis of the information button equations, which I, I, you can see here is actually very, very simple. A small change in the encoder is going to yield a small change in the decoder when they're both optimal. And the question is, are there points where there are more, there's more than one solution to the problem? These are the critical points or the bifurcation points of this differential equation, if you want. And these are precisely the points where the the topology change, there's some sort of bifurcation of the representation, which is very, in this very, very simple toy example, there are only two points here, one here and one here, which respond to this split and this split. So we know we have actually a complete understanding of this type of, of splits. And, and we, we can actually write it as some sort of a nonlinear eigenvalue problem in, in beta, and the solution of this, uh, of this uh, problem, we actually just published, uh, put on the web a paper with Nogo Zaslavsky on exactly those equations, and, 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 and we, we know how to find those critical points. And my argument and this criti these critical points, the bifurcation of the solutions, really determine 
the, it's really the skeleton of the problem. This is, this is the whole information bottleneck bound where the layers eventually lie on uh, are, are determined by those critical points. That's, where, that's the important point, where their representation changes topology. Some new feature emerge, or, or two features merge, or so on. So uh, what we also know, again, from analysis I did uh, last year, is that at these critical points, there is a phenomenon known as critical slowing down, which physicists know for many, many years. Uh, it's actually easy to see that when you get to a critical point, those iterations diverge. So you have the number of iterations here, if you look at it more carefully, the number of iterations at, at the critical points where you have these transitions, precisely uh, at this point, you have an, an exponential, uh, you know, a power law divergence, 1 over 1 minus beta lambda, where lambda is the second I value of this vector, of this uh, matrix. So essentially, there's divergence of iterations. What we know now is that this divergence of iteration is, is true for any gradient-based method. So even if you do backpropagation or stochastic gradients and whatever, at these points, if you are close to the optimal line, the iterations are going to diverge. It's going to be a very slow convergence. So my conjecture is, or my hypothesis is, that, that this uh, slowing down along the critical points is going to determine where the layers are going to end each one. And that's precisely the kind of results we are working on now. I mean, so we actually know that, so this is just a, a sketch of, uh, of this uh, divergence, critical point divergence. And we know that any iteration between the encoder and the decoder done by stochastic gradient descent or done by any other alternating projection, any, any local algorithm which makes small change to the encoder and then small change to the decoder is going to diverge eventually at this point. So that's very interesting because maybe back propagation with stochastic gradient descent is really pushing these points all the way to these critical, critical values, and that's why we see them get stuck somewhere. What is really nice about it is that I know at this point exactly what feature emerge or what feature is lost, or essentially what the layer is asking about the data, which was not there before. So this is a completely interpretable network in the sense that if I know the critical points and I know where the layers are, I can tell you what each layer encodes, or decodes, or compresses. And, and, and eventually what we also know is that the whole information plan is full of those, what I call phase boundaries, very much like many other nonlinear problems. I mean, so if you look at, at those critical points at different values of the stochasticity of the problem, you get this uh, zoo of, of lines, which essentially tell you here, along these lines, the convergence is going to be very slow. And what is nice about it is that when you take the limit, the deterministic limit, I mean, the, 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 the limit of, of completely deterministic rule, the critical points are just a limit of the noisy critical points. So they stay there even for deterministic the rules. And that's nice because it's telling us that even if you train not a noisy but a, a deterministic rule, you're going to get stuck <coughs> precisely at this limiting uh, critical point, which can in principle be calculated from the data alone. So this actually uh, coincides very nicely with what uh, Surya, Surya that just told us, that uh, the, 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 the actual problem, I mean, how the neural network behaves is, depend, is a function, some sort of, of combination of the architecture, how many layers you have there, and the data. This is the properties of the data only. And, and these critical lines is where eventually the layers are going to lie. And if this is true in general, if we can actually make it into something useful in high dimension, which is a big if, uh, then, uh, then we are beginning to have some sort of interpretation of what each layer represents, because the button is telling us exactly what the encoder and the decoder are. OK, I'm, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> There's a lot more to say, but uh, uh, essentially, I, I stand behind most of what I said so far, despite the criticism, although I have to correct uh, some of my statements and make them much more carefully, or more, much more rigorous, and this will take time. And I want to thank you and just pay your attention to a special issue of entropy on, on this uh, story, which uh, we are, the deadline is the end of December, but we are going to be very tolerant if you send us paper later on. There are already something like 15 papers submitted to this special including some of our people. OK, thank you very much. OK, we, we probably have time for a question or two as uh, Boris gets set up. Yes. Are critical points in the representation, which means that the, the 
in the same sense that you have critical points in differential equations. If you actually look at it as a differential equation in beta, those points are points where you have two solutions that compete with each other. It's a bifurcation point of a differential equation, precisely. But in the representation, the representation changes topology. OK, I know it was too fast, but it's all right. No more questions? Thank you.